Hey everybody, welcome back to another video lecture. This time we're finally going to get to see where that ATP comes from. Chapter 20. Alright, so we looked at glycolysis. We saw um, um, some substrate level ATP made and some NADH, some electron carrier. We looked at uh, citrus, citric acid cycle in the last chapter. We saw some more electron carriers as well as um, some GTP made, which is an ATP equivalent. Now we get to see how all those NADHs, and in the one case of the FADH2, uh, how all that gets turned into energy, and why we, um, you know, need oxygen. This is where does the oxygen actually come in to oxidative phosphorylation, which is what we've been talking about, but not really looking at. All right, so we're going to cover basically all of that. Okay, so we know in our bodies, aerobic uh, environment, air is uh, oxygen is required. Um, we looked at how glycolysis dealt with the production of pyruvate um, and what it did with that um, in an anaerobic situation. Lactic acid in our bodies, ethanol and other acetaldehyde and whatnot in um, some microorganisms as a means of regenerating that um, NAD+. Now we get to see, or we saw in the last chapter, um, what happens when oxygen is present, but this time we get to see where, where the oxygen actually fits in. Okay, so electron transport chain is ideally, um, ba it's just uh, a way of pumping protons. Now, um, it, it's going to be a series of redox reactions. Ultimately, uh, the goal is to, to pump as many protons as possible, to create as big of a, of a pH gradient um, as possible, because we're going to see that that's what ultimately drives the ATP synthesis. Um, and so we're going to see that there's a few complexes in this electron transport chain um, where these electron carriers are going to give their electrons to these proteins that are going to pump hydrogens. So we need to see a little bit more about uh, what this setup looks like. So I keep mentioning the proton gradient uh, or a pH gradient. Um, hydrogen ions, we know that's how we measure uh, pH. This is the, the, the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. And uh, so we're, we're talking about these protons. We're going to look at the mitochondria here in a second so you can see where exactly these are being pumped into. But I'd like to, to make the connection to this is like water in a dam. It's built up energy that we can now you know, let that water out and, and allow it to drive a process. Here's the mitochondria. So all of the stuff that we're talking about in chapter 19 is taking place inside the matrix, which is this lighter colored area. Now glycolysis took place out here, and we're going to need to figure out how the NADHs that were generated out here actually get inside, and we'll save that for the end. Um, all of the proteins that we're going to be looking at are, are sort of integral proteins on the inner membrane of these two membranes that the mitochondria has. And they are going to be taking hydrogens from electron carriers in the cytosol of the mitochondria. So that was a bad, a bad choice of words. Cytosol we'll refer to as out here, the cytosol, the matrix. From the matrix of the mitochondria and pumping those hydrogens into the intermembrane space, the space in between the inner and outer membranes. Um, and so if you, they keep doing that, and of course these complexes, electron transport is happening all along these membranes, so that it really is high pH inside this space and low pH um, in the matrix. Okay, so that's where all of this is happening. Now we're going to zoom in on one little portion of the inner membrane and sort of look at how the electron transport happens. All right, so there's a series of complexes. We'll go into each one individually. Um, we'll call them complex one through four. Complex five is gonna be the actual ATP synthase. Um, these complexes are multi-enzyme systems. So some of them have, uh, you know, eight, 10, you know, or more moving parts, different um, protein associations. Um, we're also going to see there's a couple of electron carriers, uh, coenzyme Q and cytochrome C, 
We're also going to see other cytochromes associated with uh, the multi-enzyme systems, and we'll look at a little bit of the structure of those cytochromes and how they, um, uh, you know, sort of um, what their role is in these redox reactions. Um, and then we're going to look at how NADH and FADH ultimately interact with these different complexes to uh, transfer their electrons. Okay. The end game here is that oxygen is going to receive those electrons and the protons being pumped uh, to make water. Oh, to make water. So this is a, a schematic here. Um, so this is showing all of the different transfers that are going to happen from our electron carriers NADH and FADH2. Um, we've got a flavoprotein here that's going to associate uh, or receive electrons from NADH. We've got coenzyme Q that's going to receive electrons from both that flavoprotein and from FADH2. Uh, we're going to see transfer of coenzyme Q's electrons to the cytochromes, 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 and cytochromes. Uh, all transfer, and they're skipping a few other little, pro uh, little parts in here, um, ultimately to give electrons to oxygen. Now, different proteins um, are going to have a, a role in pumping the protons. And so complex 1 is going to pump some hydrogens. Complex 2 is going to pump some hydrogens. Complex 4 is going to pump some hydrogens. Uh, so if this is the, you know, um, the, the, the inner membrane, then this would be the matrix and this would be the intermembrane space. We'll go into more detail on a, on a picture like this in a few slides. Okay, electron transport, one carrier uh, creates proton gradient uh, as they, they transfer electrons to each other. We're gonna take a, a closer look at some of the structures of these different complexes, some of their um, individual molecules uh, so we can better um, see these redox reactions and these uh, sites of proton pumping. Okay. Um, this section of the book deals with how it was determined, um, which order of events takes place, how, how, we, how do we know complex 1 transfers electrons to complex 2 to complex 3 and so on. This goes back to something you will, would have learned in, in your um, general chemistry, probably 1B, uh, you talk about standard reduction potentials. Um, you, you create a, a chart uh, of reactivity. Um, and it looks something like this. I think I've got a, a slide in here. Something like this. Now this one is specific for the reactions of the electron transport chain um, and not just uh, general reductions of elements, which you might have um, been familiar with from Chem 1B. Now, um, just to kind of show you what these numbers are, these numbers are, um, reduction potentials are what we would read on a meter um, if we were to put into solution, um, let's say uh, an equilibrium of, if, if we were talking about here iron, we could put iron three plus um, in solution and solid iron um, and connect them to something else, another element, um, and, and you gotta make a full, full loop here so that the electrons have a a way to be transferred, and then we'd see which direction the electrons get transferred from. Are the electrons in the iron going to go to the other metal and actually generate more iron 3 plus and reduce the other metal, um, or is electrons going to transfer from the other metal into the iron 3 plus and let it deposit as, as um, solid iron? You know, this is the kind of um, electron transfer or redox reaction that we're talking about. Now, the numbers come around from comparing them uh, individual reactions to something. You have to have something to compare them to, otherwise these numbers are kind of meaningless. And so we compare everything to the reduction of hydrogen gas, which we set to be zero. And so if, um, if we hook up an element to hydrogen gas and we get a positive, um, if that element gets um, reduced instead of hydrogen, then we define those to be um, positive potentials. If something, um, if, if hydrogen gets reduced um, and so then we rank them onto, um, you know, we rank their potentials onto tables. And so we'll get a table like this. 
And so here, any reaction will be spontaneous in that direction or in that, the way it's written, right? These are all reductions, so they'll all gain electrons um, when coupled to a reaction below it on this list. So the more positive ones have a higher chance of happening when you pair them with different reactions, right? So um, you can see here one of the electron uh, carriers, NADH, we know that this thing is going to get oxidized when it reduces oxygen. So the difference or the amount of energy is going to be the difference essentially between these two numbers. Now it doesn't happen directly from NADH to oxygen. There's a series of reactions that happens. But the reason we are able to put them in order in the electron transport chain is because of tables like this. So we know um, which electrons are transferred to which substances in sequence um, in order to generate the most uh, uh, free energy, right? And that would be to maximize um, the distance between these two reactions. So it'll, it'll go in this direction, right? We'll get transfer to cytochrome B before we get transfer to cytochrome C and so on. In terms of figuring out free energy, um, the Nernst equation is what I believe this one is, um, actually lets you calculate delta G if you know um, the cell's potential, a cell potential, and that's what you would get um, from the previous table. So substituting delta E, uh, a couple of constants here, Faraday's constant, uh, with um, N being the number of electrons, a lot of the reactions that we're looking at are one electron transfers, um, then, we were, then we can calculate the delta G. So whenever delta G's are mentioned here, um, that's how we know them. Okay, so uh, this little section of the book was just uh, kind of a, a, a review on um, what reduction potentials are and how we could use those to um, sort of elucidate the series of events in the electron transport chain. Okay, so here's a little bit of a, of a bigger picture. Um, of a, this one includes some of those... Um, flavoproteins rather than just the, end, the, the cytochromes from the previous picture. So here also complexes are, are shown. So complex one you can see here uh, is a, a flavoprotein and an iron sulfur protein. Complex two is going to be a reaction that we actually looked at um, in the citric acid cycle. Um, you remember succinate gets turned into fumarate and we pr produce an FADH2. Well this is, this is actually part of the citric acid cycle right here. So we've already looked at that, but what we didn't see is what happens to that FADH2 um, and, and how that gets its electron transferred to cytochrome, I'm sorry, to coenzyme Q. That's complex two. Complex three, uh, we're going to see coenzyme Q is going to ultimately transfer its electrons to cytochrome C, and that's um, what facilitates that. And then complex four transfers cytochrome C's electrons to oxygen, um, and so we'll look at those. And so you can see here there's some of the players. Now iron sulfur proteins are named so because they contain iron and sulfur. Uh, we'll see iron is, a, is actually the main um, oxidizing agent and reducing agent uh, for a lot of these cytochromes. And uh, okay. So complex one. This is NADH coenzyme Q oxidoreductase. This transfers the NADH electrons to coenzyme Q. It's an integral part of the membrane, meaning that it is um, membrane bound. It is a protein that is inserted in that lipid, uh, that lipid layer of the um, inner membrane space. Um, again, iron sulfur clusters, hence it gets named um, iron sulfur proteins. Uh, so several of them. This one also has um, the flavin mononucleotide FMN, which is why it is called a flavor protein. So just a kind of a series of events here. Um, don't get ca too caught up on the notations. Um, big picture stuff. So NADH and the enzyme react together to reoxidize NAD+. So now it's available to go back to the citric acid cycle. And we get um, the reduced form of the enzyme. The reduced form of the enzyme will react with the oxidized form of the iron sulfur protein to reduce the iron sulfur protein and oxidize the flavor protein. And then in the last step, the reduced form of the flavor pro of the iron sulfur protein uh, will oxidize and reduce 
coenzyme Q. So it gets oxidized, coenzyme Q gets reduced. So big picture, which I believe is going to be this next summary equation, uh, overall equation there, is that we regenerate NAD plus and we reduce coenzyme Q. Here's coenzyme Q. So coenzyme Q uh, is a quinone, and in its reduced form, it's called a hydroquinone. So you can see both of these oxygens here are going to be reduced to alcohol groups. So it carries two hydrogens and two electrons. All right, this is one of those reactions that um, gives off a lot of energy. It's one of the reactions that can also now, using that energy, um, pump protons across a gradient. So um, complex one will drive some, some of those electrons. I'm sorry, it will drive some of those protons um, from the, the, the matrix of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space. So you can see here all these negative values for these different transfers. Of course, we're just looking at this step right here, but um, again, enough energy to pump some protons. Okay, complex two. Complex two starts in the citric acid cycle where succinate gets um, oxidized uh, into fumarate um, and FAD gets reduced into FADH. Now, FADH, this is where um, it enters into the um, electron transport chain. Um, again, these um, uh, this is inside the matrix of the, the mitochondria. Um, FADH will oxidize, will itself be oxidized, and the iron sulfur protein will become reduced. And now that's carrying the electrons and the hydrogens. And then that will in turn give some electrons to coenzyme Q. So uh, FADH doesn't do it exact, uh, in person you could say. Um, it hands them off through the iron sulfur protein, but same uh, result is that we get coenzyme Q in a reduced form. So now at the end of, of complex two, both of our electron carriers have done their jobs. NADH has donated its electrons to coenzyme Q and so has FADH2. Um, this gives off energy, but it is not enough energy uh, to, to, to drive the pumping of protons. And so um, no ATP will be, um, um, well, no, no direct ATP will come from the protons pumped or lack of protons pumped, I guess we could say. These electrons will ultimately go on to do a job though. All right, so uh, we're now um, at coen uh, coenzyme Q, which is um, sitting there right about to hand off its electrons to complex three. So complex three is going to be made up of um, a few different cytochromes. So uh, cytochromes are heme-containing proteins. We're gonna look at the heme group and how they vary from cytochrome to cytochrome in a few slides. Uh, the main point here for all the cytochromes is that they all contain an iron core, similar to how hemoglobin um, has the iron at the center of a heme group in our um, hemoglobin molecules. Uh, this heme group, though, um, doesn't bind any oxygen. Um, the iron will be reduced from iron 3 to iron 2 and then reoxidized back into iron 3, um, and that's how it's going to function as an electron carrier. Uh, I mentioned that there are several types of cytochromes. Um, they're designated um, with either different letter lowercase um, subscripts uh, or um, subscripts underneath the different letters. So like C, cytochrome C and cytochrome C1 are both different uh, cytochromes. Um, this is the uh, structure of heme. You can see here uh, the various positions that are the same, the various that are different. They're all numbered, one, two, three, and so on positions here on the side of the table, and you can see that um, like our A cytochromes and our C cytochromes do differ in some things. Um, C cytochromes tend to have at position two um, cysteine groups, which we don't see, I guess, in cytochrome A's and so on. Um, so that's how they're uh, structured. Okay, so complex three um, involves silver proteins as well. 
Um, this is coenzyme Q um, H2 cytochrome C oxidoreductase. So this is going to transfer the electrons from our now reduced uh, coenzyme Q uh, into the cytochromes. Uh, cytochrome C uh, is going to take those electrons and we're going to get some hydrogens that will be pumped into the intermembrane space. Uh, we're going to need two molecules of cytochrome C for every coenzyme Q. And if you notice, that that's because iron 3 to iron 2 only needs one electron, yet this coenzyme Q is carrying two electrons. So we're going to have to see how that works here in a second. Um, we'll talk about the B cytochromes and their role also in a few seconds. Okay, so that's the stoichiometric relationship between the cytochrome C's and the reduced coenzyme Q. So here is what we've been looking at. So the NADH coming in, here's our flavoprotein and our iron sulfur uh, part of the complex one. We're not seeing complex two here where, where FADH dropped off its, uh, FADH2, sorry, drops off its electrons. What we're looking at right now is the relationship between coenzyme Q and two cytochrome C's as cytochrome C um, needs to get those two electrons from coenzyme Q, we're going to see that there's something called the Q cycle um, that actually uh, facilitates coenzyme Q being able to just give one electron at a time uh, to cytochrome C. So let's take a look at that. Uh, it's worth talking about here too. A coenzyme Q is actually soluble um, within this bilayer uh, of, that separates the matrix from the intermembrane space. It's soluble within it. So it kind of travels around. Of course, all of these sort of move around. Um, but coenzyme Q is able to move around in between them. Um, cytochrome C actually is um, on the intermembrane space side of the uh, bilayer. Um, and that moves around, you know, on within that side of it. Um, okay. Uh, it's also interesting that these proteins, um, in their efforts to, you know, maintain the intermembrane space, uh, High, uh, low pH, they selectively take hydrogens from this side and pump them this way. They don't, you know, whenever they're going through their reactions, they don't ever take hydrogens from the other side and pump them the other way. Um, that's part of nature's uh, sort of selectivity towards, uh, you know, maintaining these proton gradients. thought that was interesting. Um, okay, this is how the Q cycle works. So the Q cycle involves cytochrome B. Uh, the point of cytochrome B is, is essentially to um, transfer the electrons. They basically oxidize and reduce each other uh, and then back to cytochrome Q so that it can always just be giving one electron to cytochrome C. Um, so it's just uh, dealing with the fact that cytochrome C can only take one electron and coenzyme Q has two of them. Uh, this works because coenzyme Q actually exists in a third form. So it has an oxidized form or it's quinone form, it's got a reduced or hydroquinone form, and then it has a semi-quinone form where only one of those oxygens um, is uh, reduced. And so because of this, it's able to participate in this little Q cycle. Um, yeah, okay. One electron passed from a reduced coenzyme Q to the iron sulfur cluster to cytochrome C leaving the Q in the semiquinone form. The semiquinone, along with the oxidized and reduced forms of coenzyme Q, participates in the cyclic process in which two B cytochromes are reduced and oxidized in turn. So I basically said all that. Um, so again, complex three, like complex one, does produce enough energy to pump protons. So this is going to help ATP um, synthesis in a couple of minutes. Complex four. This is the last part of the uh, electron transport. So now cytochrome C has taken its electrons over to complex four and cytochrome C oxidase is going to move those electrons uh, to oxygen. So the overall reaction here, we see some reduced cytochrome C's are going to be reoxidized and oxygen is going to be reduced to water. There is a copper intermediate here 
Um, we're going to see that there's some transfers for the, from A cytochromes. Uh, copper does act as an intermediate. You can see that here, cytochrome C to cytochrome A through copper to cytochrome A3. Uh, again, some other reactions showing the oxida oxidation and reduction of various cytochromes. The overall reaction here has not changed. Okay. So this is the summary of the energetics of all of these oxidation and reduction reactions. As you can see a couple of them uh, were not very uh, energy releasing, um, but in the end, there was a lot of energy released. We can take a look at um, what uh, the, uh, the the orientation of the um, iron looks like in some of these non-heme and heme um, in the proteins. So all the cytochromes contained uh, heme groups. Iron was involved in all of these heme groups. They're different from each other. We saw this already in, in how um, in their various side groups and side chains. They're also different in how they actually connect to their main protein. Um, in the non-heme proteins, the iron is associated with sulfur or sulfide ions. This is two of those ways. Um, or with cysteine residues, which of course contain the sulfurs. So this is how the iron is. Now of, in these, it's the, iron, the iron is not participating in the actual reduction or oxidation. It's just part of the protein. And so we don't, we're not, we were not shown any of the reduced or oxidized um, structures for any of those iron sulfur proteins. Okay, so all of this um, energy uh, potential that was, uh, you know, being driven by this electron transport uh, and all the protons that were pumped, now what happens? So once we've built up this pH gradient, um, we essentially have um, a means of driving this, this new uh, reaction. So uh, the difference in the concentration has created a voltage gradient. And a coupling process, we're going to look at two of them, converts the energy of this gradient into ATP. Now there's uh, two, two terms. One's chemoosmotic coupling, the other is uh, conformational coupling. I believe those are the terms. Um, we're going to look at those. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about AT ATP synthase. This is the actual protein that's going to be um, making ATP. Now, um, okay, so ATP synthase is what actually links the ATP phosphorylation with the oxidation right, of oxygen, uh, I'm sorry, the oxidation of NADH and FADH2, and of ultimately oxidation of glucose. Um, so synthase is going to have two portions. It has an F0, so the F0, right? This is going to be the portion of the membrane that allows the hydrogen ions back into the mitochondrial matrix. It's got an F1 portion. This is the portion that's the, the ATP synthesis uh, site, or the, 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 the catalytic part. That part actually has a few different um, chains. It has three alpha chains, three beta chains, a gamma, delta, epsilon chain. I think there's, what, um, nine different little parts in there. So it's a, it's a pretty neat little thing. In fact, I'll, I'll try to link a video in the description of this. Um, if I forget to do that, just Google ATP synthase uh, on YouTube, or sorry, YouTube it, and you will see a nice... Uh, little um, 3D model um, and showing this little molecular motor in its all, all its glory. You should check that out. So this is it. Um, and so here you can kind of see the F0 structure, a, a few of these um, super uh, secondary sort of structures. Uh, this sort of, um, what is it kind of made? It's kind of made like a tunnel, kind of like a, like a, you know, um, and so this, this is actually going to spin. And we've got the F1 portion here with all those different little subunits. Okay, 
Uh, so hydrogens from the inner membrane space are going to come in and essentially interact with all of these chains and then get released. So it, it's driving this sort of um, this little motor. Now um, we can actually uncouple these two things. Uh, these are coupled together. We can uncouple them. Uh, there are uncouplers. They're basically you know antibiotics or or things you would. You know, why would you want to uncouple them? Well, you want your organism to die. You don't want it to be able to make ATP. Uh, we know that these two processes are coupled because when we separate them from each other, the two processes on their own still happen. For example, when we take away ATP synthase, electron transport still happens. Uh, oxygen still gets reduced to water. We just don't get ATP. Um, we've also done experiments where we can actually get ATP to be made without... Um, the electron transport chain, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, so these these drugs here, um, these different uh, gramicidin and uh, di dinitrophenol, these are uncouplers that will actually go and and cause um, ATP synthase to uh, effectively stop making ATP without disrupting uh, electron transport. Um, the way that we calculate how much ATP essentially um, each NADH or FADH2 is worth comes from um, a, a ratio of phosphate to oxygen. Um, and so this is the ratio they've sort of come up with, 2.5 and 1.5. We're going to use these numbers to, to count how many ATPs essentially that we can make. Um, we, know, um, we know that electron transport creates the proton gradient. We know that ATP synthase um, uses the protons in order to kind of catalyze some part of the reaction. What the discussion sort of, where it sort of got, gets into a place where people disagree is on, on the actual little details. Um, but there are, they are in agreement about two things, uh, that the proton flow is coupled to ATP but that there seems to be something going on with the protein itself, um, conformational changes that are actually making the ATP. It's not that the hydrogens have some role in it. Um, and so they've kind of separated these two into uh, two different titled mechanisms. So chemoosmotic coupling requires the proton gradient as a mechanism for driving the ATP synthase. And conformational coupling depends on the different subunits of the F1 uh, portion of the ATP synthase to actually make ATP. So let's look at the two of those. Now we know chemoosmotic coupling is a thing. We know that it's required because when we take parts of membranes that have ATP synthase in them and we artificially create pH gradients, even with no electron transport, ATP synthase will work. We also know um, that these. Um, uh, we also know that the pro oh, so this is just talking about the proton gradient here on this slide, and I mentioned this to you guys already. Um, that the the proteins are not asymmetrically or symmetrically oriented, meaning that they will pump protons one direction but not the other. Um, and so, you know, this is um, this is one of the reasons why a proton gradient exists. I guess that's the point of this slide. Now, um, this is just showing. Uh, those points again where the uh, protons are pumped. Now I was mentioning that, that we know that this is the case because of some of the experiments that are done either with uh, you know artificial um, membranes and whatnot. So let's take a look at that. So um, one of the, the key features for um, this sort of system is compartments. You have to have compartments. There's, if you don't have compartments and there's nowhere to build up a hydrogen gradient right or pH gradient. And so without compartments, this isn't a process. So, so that's one of the, the first things they figured out was essential. Um, one of the other things that they looked at is that uh, even little vesicles, as long as they contain some sort of um, gradient or some sort of way of separating hydrogen ions, can carry out this, this oxidative phosphorylation. And so they um, were able to s essentially pinch off um, little parts of the membrane. Um, of course, they wanted the mitochondri mitochondrial membrane because it already had ATP synthase in it. Um, what they were able to do is um, artificially put in a different proton pump uh, 
So bacterial rhodopsin um, effectively does proton pumping, but it isn't um, an electron transport chain component. Um, and by putting these two things together, so, so taking a part of the membrane, closing it off, right, so that it creates its own little vesicle. So now there's an inside and an outside. Um, you know, the inside here being the intermembrane space, the outside being kind of like the matrix. Uh, and then within that vesicle, if you have an ATP synthase and you have an intermembrane space and you have bacterial rhodopsin in this vesicle putting protons in there, and, and of course bacterial rhodopsin works um, from with light, so if you shine light on it, it turns on and starts pumping protons. Um, <clears throat> they were able to show that ATP synthase uh, could work in this condition. So they know that it's coupled to the proton pump. These things, this is, one needs the other to work. Now, that doesn't sh discuss or, or elucidate how phosphorylation happens. And so that's where the other part comes in, the conformational part. Um, and so let's take a look at that. Uh, again, so hydrogens flow back. ATP is synthesized conformational coupling. So what is thought is that the F1 portion of ATP synthase actually has three different sort of um, conformations. It has an open conformation, it has a loose binding conformation, and it has a tight binding conformation. And it's tight binding where ATP is made. It's loose binding where ADP and phosphate would bind. And it's open where it would be released. ATP would be released in the open conformation. And so you can kind of imagine that as this is sitting here and hydrogens are flowing through the core of this thing, this thing's sort of spinning like a little, uh, like a little wheel. And that um, the tight complex here, let's just say it's just bound some ATP. And so then it turns and the ATP would then be in the open. Let's see, which way is this thing turning? I guess this thing isn't turning. At, oh, it is turning. But it's turning, like, why is the purple one down and then up again? Oh, well, either way. This thing would be alternating positions, um, sort of like, uh, sort of like um, RNA polymerase did, right? On the, um, no, 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 sort of like um, a ribosome has the, those alternate sites on the, on the mRNA. And then as it shifted over, different sites opened up, right? So ADP and phosphate would bind in the loose site. ATP would be synthesized from the ADP and phosphate that were just in a loose site that just became a tight site, right? Because this will turn into this. Loose will turn into tight. And then tight will turn into open, and that will release the ATP. And then the open will turn back into a loose and bind some more. And then loose will turn tight, and they will react and form ATP, and then it will open again and let it out. So definitely, maybe I'll try to include that video right here. So let, let me see if I can remind myself. Video here. All right, so if you don't see the video right now, then I forgot. Okay, we were talking a little bit earlier about how do we get those NADHs that were formed during glycolysis into the... Uh, mitochondrial matrix so that they can give their electrons to the um, electron transport chain. So there's actually two mechanisms. There's one called the glycerol phosphate shuttle, and these are both shuttle mechanisms. Glycerol phosphate shuttle actually lets um, NADH be reoxidized in the cytosol, um, and it creates <coughs> FADH2, which can pass, uh, apparently can pass electrons right into uh, the electron transport chain. Are we going to see how this one works? Uh, doesn't actually say how this gets it in. So that doesn't really answer anything. Um, it comes from glycerol phosphate being produced by dihydroxyacetone phosphate. If you remember, in glycolysis, reaction 5 of glycolysis actually turned our dihydroxyacetone phosphate um, into 3-glyceraldehyde, or, or sorry, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate which is what entered into the second half of glycolysis. So this molecule generated pretty, pretty early in sugar metabolism um, is a, a key here to this shuttle, uh, to this, this uh, transport system. 
Oh, here we go. It does actually show us. Okay, good. So in glycolysis, we generated NADH. NADH then is going to be uh, reoxidized and turning dihydroxy, dihydroxy acid and phosphate into glycerol phosphate. Glycerol phosphate apparently can cross the barrier into the mitochondrial matrix. Once inside there, it can be turned back into dihydroxyacetone phosphate. That process generates an FADH, and then dihydroxyacetone phosphate comes back out. And so this circular uh, shuttle system just transports the electrons that were generated um, from a glycolysis into somewhere where they can go into the citric acid cycle. So unfortunately, we could have made 2.5 ATPs from NADH, but we're going to have to settle for 1.5. There's a trade-off. We can't do anything with the NADH out here, so better than you know getting nothing, we can get less ATPs for it. Now there's a better shuttle. There's the malate, uh, malate aspartate shuttle as well. This one actually regenerates an NADH within the mitochondria, so it's it's an equivalent exchange. Let me show you how this one works. So um, we'll just jump to the we'll just jump to this picture here. So there's two two parts. We'll look at the big picture um, in a second. So we're talking about the NADH from glycolysis. So in order to get this one inside. Oxaloacetate, right, can't cross the membrane, but malate can. So oxaloacetate will get um, reduced into malate. Malate crosses the barrier, and there's uh, uh, malate dehydrogenase, the same enzyme that, that turned oxaloacetate into malate, uh, turns it back into oxaloacetate, okay? And that regenerates the NADH. So effectively, the NADH from glycolysis is now an NADH in the citric acid cycle. Um, now, oxaloacetate still can't get out of the mitochondria, so it, got, it has to get turned back into aspartate, which can come out. And so aspartate through malate, through aspartate, through malate, this thing is cyclic. This is how this process keeps going. Now, the problem uh, is turning oxaloacetate into aspartate, and so that has to go um, through another little side shuttle here. And that one is catalyzed by alpha ketoglutarate and glutamate. Both of these can cross the barrier. Both of these can be transaminated into each other. And both of these facilitate oxaloacetate and aspartate conversion. And so these two little cyclic processes in, in conjunction with each other uh, allow for the NADH and glycolysis to make it into the citric acid cycle. So again, the NADH generated in glycolysis can be worth 2.5 in the malate aspartate shuttle, but only 1.5 in the glycerol phosphate shuttle. So depending on which shuttle you use, we can get between 30 or 32 ATP for every glucose, for every uh, six carbon glucose. Now we get more for fatty acids, we get more, um, uh, well, depending on the proteins, we can get uh, a lot for proteins as well depending on where they enter into the citric acid cycle. Um, so yeah, that's a big improvement over the, what was it, two that we got for, from glycolysis alone. So aerobic um, uh, conditions versus anaerobic conditions add an additional 30 ATP. And so this here It's just a summary. So this is kind of showing us what we put in, if it costs us any ATPs, what we get out, um, differences between the uh, uh, NADHs and FADHs. So if we generate two FADHs, uh, then they get converted into ATPs, I believe, somewhere, somewhere in here. This table is a little hard to read. Uh, but basically, glycerol phosphate shuttle versus malate aspartate shuttle. Again, you get slightly more ATPs with the malate aspartate shuttle. But this is how the calculation of 30 to 32 and where it comes from. All right. That's about it. All right, guys. So that was the last chapter on metabolism. We're going to look at photosynthesis after this in our final video lecture of the semester. Hope you guys are staying safe out there, healthy, 
See you guys next time.